Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming the very wonderful and talented Lila Dubey. Please. Sitting here. Welcome uh, to Google. Have you been to Google in the Bay Area before? No, I haven't actually. I haven't, no. I mean, I've been to the Bay Area, but I haven't been to Google. Plus, <laughs> oh, so you were missing the best part of the Bay Area, so now, now, you know, now you're yeah. done. This is, this now is... I have made up for it. Now, yeah. Um, well, welcome. Um, I am uh, delighted uh, to be here, um, like I said, because Partly because we're from Pune. Um, yes. Could you tell us a little bit about... Uh... First, I have to say that it is a very epic moment for me to be here at Google, really. And I'm not just saying that because uh, today, like Durga, you know, Durga is this goddess with eight hands. Um, Google is our Durga, you know. Whatever we need comes from Google. So it's not just for that. It's because today I was thinking a lot about how I would start chatting with you all, and I thought of my father. My father was what is called a Renaissance man, a da Vinci of our times, in his own way, because he was an engineer by profession, he was a physicist by passion, his passion was uh, the special theory of relativity. When he got married to my mother, he told her, I have one mistress, and that's physics. So don't, don't bother me, because I'm gonna spend a lot of time with her. So, um, and he used to get, every few years, the Britannica, you know, as it got updated. And my earliest memories are, he had a fabulous library. He was very fond of books. Uh, so there was one sort of room half dedicated to books and we used to get the Britannica. And I thought of him today and I said, what an epic moment. Dad, you would be smiling today up there because I'm at Google. And he got, he worked till he was 88. He got cancer when he was 88 and he had a computer in his office. But suddenly he told me, I want a laptop. I said, do you even know how to use a laptop? He said, I'll learn it, it's not a big deal. And we got onto it and I remembered Google because I said, Dad, he was very low, it was a few months before he died. I said, do you wanna see what you've done in your life? Do you wanna see some of your achievements? He said, how would I do that? So I said, we hit Google and we find your name and we see what you've done. And my dad gave talks at Imperial College, wrote for Nature, he, uh, he gave uh, talks at uh, King's College, lots of places on physics. So he was, that was the last time I heard him smile, I saw him smile, I saw his eyes light up, because he saw so many sites on which he was there. And I remembered him with great, great love today when I was coming to Google, I have to share that. And the other thing I wanted to share was that my mother she was obviously not there because she's never printed anything, you know, published anything, and you only get to Google if you've, if you've been somewhere, you know, uh, on print. I mean, that's how I assume it's all collated. And my mother was feeling very left out, and I said, how do I cheer her up? So I said, you know, Mom, your dad was the first FRCP, the Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians from Edinburgh, and he also, uh, I'm Sikh by religion, and we have the holy book, and my grandfather also translated the first two gospels, let's say, of that holy book into English. So I said, I'm sure he's there. So we Googled him. And in one of the, one of the things that, uh, one of the sites that were there, he mentioned all his children, including my mother. So I said, hey, you're there too on the internet. And she was so thrilled. She was so thrilled that her father was there. So I said, before we talk about anything else, I have to tell you, that because sort of my journey in my life, um, which is peculiar because I, I will tell you about where I come from and how sometimes the things that you get from your parents, which are very strong characteristics, also help you to break things and do things on your own. So I was remembering my parents because of Google. And I said, before I talk about anything else, I have to thank Google because two of the best moments of my dad's life before he went were, were because of Google. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for it's uh, you know it's it's uh, stories like these that keep us coming to work every day. Of course, day. So, um, of course, uh, of course. I mean, you know, obviously we are we are like uh, you know we become like little babies dependent on that on that Google map, that Google <laughs> application for almost <laughs> anything. So that goes without saying. But I'm talking about a very personal thing that touched me, uh, where Google really became far more than just an application. Yeah, that was that was a very touching story. Thank you again uh, for sharing that. So um, you uh, you studied English literature. 
how, uh, you know, in uh, a few, few uh, decades ago, how did you convince your parents to study anything that didn't sound like medicine or engineering or Very law? Very good question, because I was coming to that. Yeah. That, that, that these great parents, wonderful, wonderful parents that I had, um, were quite unique also, not, not just, I come from a very long lineage of, of academics and professionals. Okay, so my father was an engineer in Lahore Engineering College before partition. And my mother was a doctor, at, at a gynecologist at Lady Harding in Delhi. And they were both very independent, strong-minded, principled, um, super intelligent people. And they didn't get married in those days, I'm talking about 65, 70 years ago, till they were in their 30s, which was unheard of. So they gave me some very strong uh, sort of um, values and uh, good DNA on many, many, on, in many aspects. But they were also very clear that they didn't um, want me to get into the arts. So my father wanted me to be at the least a nuclear physicist, <laughs> um, at the very least, if not going to space. And my mother wanted me to be a path-breaking, you know, sort of uh, Nobel Prize-winning biologist or whatever her, you know, her medicine was her field. And it was not just her. You see, her sister was a doctor. Her father was a doctor. His father was a doctor. And uh, my father, in fact, my, my father's brother studied at Mayo in the 50s, Mayo Clinic, and set up the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And his, uh, his their cousins were, were doctors. So it was this deluge of professionals. And uh, when I said after, after school that I don't want to do anything uh, anymore to do with science, I studied science up to school, and I said, I don't have that brain. I have a left brain, and I want to use that. And my father was horrified, you know. Because, you see, he was so well-informed. He could talk to you, uh, you know, about your subject. He could talk to my mother about medicine, my husband about economics, my brother-in-law, who's a game theorist, about game theory. So he made everyone feel like, a, you know, you know that, that generation was a generation of, of um, people with a great deal of um, intellectual curiosity about. We become a, a, a generation of specialists, not me, more your generation, which is very important because depth is important and focus is important. It's so competitive. But they had a, a breadth of vision, my father, that I haven't seen very much in, in, in recent times. And it's quite wonderful. In the sense of, I remember I was reading Arundhati Nag's book, uh, Arundhati Roy's book, uh, The God of Small Things. She just won the book of it. She was a, sort of a friend of mine. And I said, you have to read this book. He said, but what do you think is so great about this book? Why do you think she got the book for it? Or if I said, you know, Jhumpa Lahiri got for the Pul a Pulitzer. She said, he said, well, what do you think? What is the reason? So I had to give him a reason for him to even look at the book, because it was a waste of time otherwise. He never read fiction. And, um, and so, uh, and he loved technology. He loved new things. He loved, he loved uh, the cosmos, reading about that. So he felt there were so many important things to read about. Why would you bother reading about literature all the time, for God's sake, and study it? So he was very, very upset because he could quote Shakespeare to me better than I could quote it to him. And he wondered why the hell did I want to waste five years of my master's studying literature? And he could never understand it. And then, you know, how Indian fathers are, he said, OK. Then I did a second master's in mass communication just because I was scared that theater may not pay me any money. So um, I should. So and I topped it, luckily. So I got a lot of offers in advertising, none of which I did. He said, OK, you're getting married now. You're, you're your husband's responsibility. I don't care what you do. <laughs> so, and my mother was more, 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 uh, she, she just gave me a, this very strong, you know, the, the sort of strong, matriarchal, very feisty, independent woman, you know, who in those days, there were two things I learned, one from my father, from my mother, which were very important to me as a philosophy. Because after I decided that I was going to do theater, I was very silly because in my master, when I was doing my master's, my father said, OK, if you must do something, you have to excel at it. Don't do something if you go half-hearted, half-baked. Go to RADA, study theater. Or go to the NSD and study theater. Don't do this, you know, just this sort of dilettantish way of doing it. So his philosophy was you will excel if you do something uh, you will be have a chance to excel only if you 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 know you really work hard and hone your skills and um, put everything into it. And my mother, uh, one one thing that was very important to me was that two things. One was that she was such an independent-minded woman that when I said no, I don't want to do this, 
She said, okay, do what you want. Do exactly what you want. In fact, she used to always tell me two things. She used to tell me, you know, in those days, we didn't have uh, eggs that we, we could freeze. So she used to say that, you know, men, you have to get married because you need children. But otherwise, you know, it's not that important to have men in your life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's smiling today because, you know, today women are freezing their eggs. Yeah. Just go to a sperm bank. I want that, that, that. They just tick off all their specifications. And we're done. You know, that is true empowerment, really, aside from financial, you know, sort of empowerment, which to me is the beginning of any empowerment. You know, in India, we talk so much about empowerment and women's uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, that they, are, that they don't have enough independence. But it's a very simple thing to me that in India, most half our population is financially not independent. So a woman takes so much from a man because she simply can't walk out of that door. She can't go back to her parents. And she has no resources, no education, no literacy to, to look after herself. So I think before any other kind of any other kind of empowerment that we talk about, we just really in India at least we have to talk about that grassroots getting them up there to be able to say, I cannot, I will not take this nonsense. I will walk out of this door. So, but my mother actually was a very, very, I think a very forward looking woman that she, she said all that. And another thing she told me, which was very important, which is all connected to my, to my being in, this, in the theater, was that, look, never look for other people and other sources of happiness. Be the architect of your own happiness. Everything else is a bonus. So if your kids love you, great. Your husband loves you, great. If he doesn't, well, you're okay. You're okay because you are the wellspring of your own happiness. So all this sort of combined to shape me to become what I am. So anyway, because they were so strong and independent, I also could be strong and independent. And I said, hey, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a nuclear physicist. But what happened was a strange thing, which I must share, because it will happen to a lot of young people, that because I did something that I was sort of impelled in, from inside me to do, you know, I felt that this was a calling. The performing arts was my calling. But I, I was not able to articulate why it was that important right then. Uh, and I used to feel right up to I was, till I was 40 that I was a bit of a dilettante. My dad had this thing, he'd come and see my plays and say, oh, oh bitter, well done, well done, you know, kind of thing. But it was like, well, if you must play it all this, then so be it. I started doing films. Uh, I was I was well recognized and all that, but it didn't make any difference to him. You know, I mean, he preferred my theater work anyway. And uh, my mother was a great beauty, and uh, all her sisters were great beauties. But in our family, it was like you know, God God gave you all that, so let's not worry about all that. Work on yourself. So you know, it was a very unusual kind of uh, background, and so I decided to do what I did. But it took me a long time to be comfortable with the fact that what I did had a lot of meaning, had a lot of relevance, that it was very important. And very t often young people, when they choose alternative careers, which are not your engineer, doctor, lawyer, computer scientist, you know, whatever, the, the sort of the general well-acknowledged uh, sort of uh, life is serious, life is earnest kind of professions, they, they feel a little like they've disappointed their parents. They, you know, I mean, today sport is recognized because it's very paying. And other professions are recognized because they're very paying. But let's say 30 years ago, these were not, uh, people played cricket, but they were not, uh, you know, they were not, uh, they were not earning a lot of money. So uh, things have changed a lot, but still I see young people who are struggling because this is not the profession that their parents would like them to do, not at all. So then you have to show your success that, you know, and it's not an easy, a creative career is the most difficult one to, to even assess success. You have very easy yardsticks in other fields. You know, a doctor has a roaring practice or he earns a huge uh, sort of amount of money at NYU medical center or you know Sloan or whatever uh, but how do you judge the success of someone in the creative world it's extremely difficult and it changes all the time today you're God you have three films that are bomb and you're out of there you're nobody so it's such a um, elusive ephemeral kind of a success that we're talking about
Anyway, well, you were asking. Well, and these days, uh, it sounds like uh, the number of YouTube followers and Twitter followers you have is a good measure of uh, success as well. So, um, <laughs> I didn't even know but, I do. But, but to, to, to your point, uh, it, it does change over time. And yes. It's yes, uh, good to yes, keep up. Yes. Uh, you, you did a lot of work, um, obviously, in uh, Bollywood and in the Indian um, arena, but also um, in the UK and uh, in Hollywood. How do you uh, compare the two experiences? It's very simple. My heart, my soul, my body belongs to the theater. I'm a dyed-in-the-wool theater person. And it's weird, because if you meet a theater person, uh, you know, when I was doing Marigold, I met Judy Dench and Maggie Smith, who had died in the wool 60 years with the National Theatre in London. So there is an immediate connect. It's a different kind of binding, bonding that happens. So my heart, everything belongs to the theatre. Because for me, theatre is where it's at. It's the last pure bastion left. It is still relatively untainted un, um, by commerce. You know, I... Uh, now, I'll tell you a little bit about my theater work because it's important in the light of all the questions you'll ask. I worked as an actress for 15 years, like a diva, doing all the lead roles with a person called Barry John and had a whale of a time. And then I started to decide to set up my own company 27 years ago. So now you know exactly like a fossil how old I am. Uh, uh, and um, I decided I want to do that for two reasons. Also, like I told you, there was this slow understanding that why are the performing arts and therefore theater important? Why are they important? What, is, what, what does art bring to us? What is so important about art? And it was like an epiphany at 40 for me that, you know, really, art is what illuminates life. It's what Shakespeare says. It's a, it's a mirror up to nature. We all live. We live a wonderful life. There are, of course, eureka moments. A mathematician proves uh, theorem which hasn't been proved or a problem that hasn't been proved for 50 years or 30 years and wow it's eureka moment uh, a runner breaks that marathon record you know there are eureka moments in every field um, but for me I feel that as a whole the whole body of the performing arts and arts as a whole including painting music all that these are the things that really enrich in our lives, illuminate our lives, you know, expand our horizons in ways uh, which, which to me, if you ask me what is divinity, it is, it is the arts. When we hear a wonderful piece of music, when we see an, read an astounding poem, you know, we come closer to something which is beyond us, you know. So to me, it, it's, it's really spiritual almost. And it's something that, that absolutely opens up dimensions in our mind which we don't even know exist. So it, it, I realized the value of it. And more than that, the value of, you know, it's, uh, we live in a technological age, okay? We're going more and more into that little screen for everything. Jag Suraya, this wonderful columnist in India once wrote that many, many years ago, that soon there will be one small little room with a small little man, with a small little smartphone, sitting in a corner, getting sex, food, clothes, whatever he wants, you know, in that small little room. In a way, it's funny. In a way, it's scary. Because the human experience is getting so uh, contracted, so contracted. And a weird thing's happening. As much as we are looking for that, that uh, sort of the virtual world in which we live and uh, the digital world in which we live, we also crave, because we are ultimately fireside storytellers. This is our DNA as well. So... And how do we connect to each other? Our common humanity is through shared experience. Why do I love theater? Because it's not complete. If he's not there and I'm not there, it's, I could be here, it's not complete. He's there, it's not complete. We need those two people to connect. So it's not just theater, it's music, it's dance, but especially theater, especially theater. I can still dance. You see, for myself, I can dance. I can sing for myself, I can paint for myself. But can I perform for myself? No, I cannot. It has to be you with me in that shared experience. And that's the beginning of our common humanity. That's how we start connecting with each other, you know? And we tell stories which are universal, let me tell you. When I did a play called Dance Like a Man in New York, the same one that ran off Broadway, the, the New York Times had never covered, covered an Indian play. And my, my, my raison d'etre for starting a company was I wanted to talk about the Indian voice 
in Indian English voice, original voice in Indian theatre. So why in English? Because then he can understand my plays. He can understand. He can he can uh, he can listen to the to the stories, the plays that have been written by our playwrights. Very often people have asked me to come, including in America. Why don't you come and direct a play? I said, but then who will tell our stories? <laughs> you have plenty of people to tell your stories. I, we don't have anyone. We have a handful of people to tell our stories. They need us to tell our stories, to, to tell a Girish Karnad's play, put it out there, a Vijay Tendulkar, uh, zillions of very talented. I remember I did a play once, and this very, very, very well-known group from America came, and this woman said, wow, that was fabulous. Who's written the play? So I said, this guy called uh, Mahesh El Kunchwar, he's Indian? <laughs> I said, it, it, but it's so, it's fantastic. I said, you know, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. <laughs> Because the way you're asking me, it's like, oh, he couldn't, have, Indian couldn't have written that play. She said, no, I really mean it's so sophisticated. I, I, I don't think anybody. So I said, thank you. You're just putting your foot in your mouth again and again and again. You know, just stop. <laughs> you know. So, so I realized that's it. We have to. So we are, the, without being too immodest, the most travelled company in India. We've done three thousand shows in India and abroad, right from Wellington, New Zealand to Portland, Seattle. And all the, through most of the countries, I haven't been to China yet, I haven't been to Russia yet, I haven't been to South America yet, a few continents left, but plenty have been, have been taken too. And let me tell you the most interesting thing. So I did it because not just that I wanted to platform Indian work, but I wanted to see, you know, we Indians have a habit, and I don't mean this badly, of patting ourselves on the back and saying, fabulous, that was wonderful, especially if you go to see a movie premiere. They're so hypocritical. Everything's mind-blowing, and then they walk out of the room and saying, oh, God, it was terrible. So, <laughs> you know, so, but Indians do that. They sort of buck each other up, and they don't really tell you the truth. So when you take an Indian play outside and do it out there in Kuala Lumpur or in Bangkok, no one's going to be generous. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's awful. So to take a play about Dalits, now Dalits is, you know, we have a caste system in India which is horrible, which is still sort of, still in the fabric of our lives, which is awful, absolutely. So there were the, you know, the very, very educated, the less educated, the warriors, and then the people who cleaned your houses, and you know, who were always the untouchables who Gandhi fought against. And um, so it's a story about them, a, a man, it's like, a black guy from Harlem, very, very dirt poor, marrying an upper west side, rich, rich white girl, you know. So for me, that story was about that. It was about culture clash, you know. And however liberal we are, you just have to scratch the surface. And then if your daughter is marrying someone like that, hello, till then we're sitting intellectuals, armchair intellectuals, saying, of course, we must integrate, we must do this and all that. And then when it comes into your own living room, you can't handle it. So I was shocked that the play like this could touch people in Kuala Lumpur, could touch, see the, the subcontinent's okay, they, they understand all these uh, references. But for it to work in, in a Kuala Lumpur or a place like uh, London, where non-Indians were seeing it, but they got it, they got all that. It didn't have to be, and I don't, I don't uh, peddle it in a sort of sweetened way. We talk as we talk. If I'm Gujarati, I talk like a Gujuban or a Gujubai. And if I'm South Indian, I talk like that. I mean, clear, but with an accent. And people said, oh, you can't do plays like this. Nobody will understand. I said, hell, I come to America. I go here, James Earl Jones doing fences with a Harlem accent. And I have to say, hello, what was that? What was that? What was that? I, I didn't understand half the play. But I still love the experience. So we have to enter those worlds. We're not going to give it to you on a platter. Come, I will explain what this means and that means. No, 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 we're going to explain nothing. You come here, you enter our world. And then you see the universality of the stories. Because like the Natya Shastra, which is our great book, 5,000 year old book that talks about the performing arts. I don't think there's an older book than that. Talks about the seven emotions only that human beings go through. The nine rasas. So they're in dance, they're in music, they're in theater. And I was shocked. I knew why the New York Times is so respected. Because when we performed there, they gave us a half-page review on their arts page on a Friday, arts review. It's like, the, it's like a Bible, you know? So I didn't know all that. They came quietly, they saw it, they quietly wrote this review, and it came out. And my friends in, in the theater in, in New York said, my God, we've been performing for 20 years, and the New York Times never covered us. So they covered us, and what was very interesting was, 
I believe he was a very tough critic and you know all that. And he gave us glowing review, but that's not the point. At the end of it, he quoted the Natya Shastra. And I said, my God, this old white guy who's like 70 years old, he really has done his homework. <laughs> and, and he's quoted the Natya Shastra and he gave us the biggest compliment I've ever got because he said, the lofty ideals of the Na Natya Shastra may be very difficult for humans to achieve, but this play comes pretty damn close. And I thought that was such a marvelous compliment. From, so, and, and another one in Portland wrote about how, you know, you enter this play and you think, oh, silk saris and Indian music and, you know, flowers in the hair and, you know, about classical Bharatanatyam dancers. And are we going to get any of this? And at the end of the play, you say, my God, this is as familiar to me, this story, with its relationships and its, and its conflicts and its everything as my kitchen sink. So that is the idea that, you know, we open doors of understanding. We celebrate our differences, but we open doors of understanding. And in that, art has such a huge role to play, such a huge role. Sports does, but sports is more in the arena of, you know, at some point we get, we get a little nationalistic, okay? Let's admit it. In art, you don't get like that. If there's some wonderful singer, I heard a fabulous band called Tinari Wen from uh, Algeria, the desert music, their Grammy Award winners. I just heard them recently in Mumbai. I didn't matter, I didn't understand their language, I didn't understand their, I didn't understood nothing of the reference to the context. But I said, wow, what music. So it elevates us, it takes us somewhere else, it, it celebrates all the differences, but it just brings us all together in such an amazing way that uh, I realize that's why I love the arts. That's why I want to be where I am. And my theater, especially, not just Indian, it's, it's also about exploring subjects. See, again, film is so determined by commerce that unless it's a very small, very independent film that is exploring something very explosive, uh, in in uh, theater, you can do that. You can do that. I mean, my plays go from sexual abuse to the first mainstream uh, play on sec homosexuality, which is still a punishable offense in India. Can you believe it? How archaic is that? Uh, to, to Gandhi's philosophy. And how did Gandhi have these out-of-the-box, we talk about out-of-the-box ideas. Each and every idea of Gandhi's was out-of-the-box. Satyagra, non-violence, yay, bo, everything if you examine. It's a brilliant play, it's got many awards. And when you see an Arab sitting after the play and talking to me about Gandhi, and you know, it is so fascinating, and you think this is a country, what would this Arab know about Gandhi? But he's fascinated, he's fascinated. Because the play was a, was a play that explored, Gandhi was the sort of the common Joe, and there was the Mahatma, and there were these debates between them, you know, and through that, he said, you know, you could do this. He said, I can't do that. I'm just an ordinary fellow. How can I do all this? He said, why? One person can make a difference. He said, oh, don't talk nonsense. One person can't do anything. And that's how he said, be the change you want to be. Because one person can do it. Two people, what are their names, who started Google? Two guys sat together. Yeah, from Mary Page yeah, and Sergey Brin. Yeah, they just sat together one day, two PhD students, and said, hey, let's do this. And that's all it is. And you guys know it better than anybody. It's just an idea the germ of an idea. So to have an Arab talking about Gandhi was very strange with all their robes and all this hat and they discussed it after the play in Dubai and in Muscat to talk about Gandhi. So it could be Gandhi's philosophy, it could be Zen Buddhism. I've done a play on Zen Buddhism because you know Zen comes from the Dhyan yeah. and Dhyan is meditation. And it's, uh, it's founded by Pallava King who was so weak, he couldn't breathe. He couldn't breathe. The king was going to throw him away. The king was this wrestler and you know, very macho and all that. And he has this little weakling of a prince who's puffing away because he's a blue baby. And he says, just chuck him. We don't need him. And the, and the Brahmin uh, who, who, who did the puja for him says, no, I'll keep him. And he teaches him yoga. And he teaches him how to breathe. And he teaches him exercises so that he learns and he creates the martial arts and becomes a 28th. Uh, sort of Zen, uh, sort of the, the the high priest of Buddhism, goes there to to uh, to China, and they couldn't pronounce Dhyan, so it became Dhyan, Chan, Jan, Zen, Zen. By the time we reached Japan, it was Zen, <laughs> you know. And I was so fascinated because I said, 
this is from India. Nobody even knows this. That, and then we did it in Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok, all that whole belt over there. And people were fascinated. And I said, hello, it all comes from here. I mean, I'm sorry, but you really, <laughs> what can I do if everything just started in India? <laughs> the zero came from here, this came from there. So, um, so the subjects I choose are very eclectic. You know, now Gohar, when I was doing Gohar, everyone said, a woman in, the, in 1902 singing some old classical Indian music. I mean, OK, so she was the one that, who sang first on a vinyl record. So she made history. And she was like an Amy Winehouse of her times, without the drugs, I think. Maybe, <laughs> she, maybe she was doing opium on the side, who knows? But um, she sang, she composed, she, she wrote her own lyrics at 15. She sang in 20 languages. She was on post, uh, you know, like little matchboxes and, and uh, um, whatever kind of publicity they had all over Europe. She was huge. She was a rock star of her time. And people thought they're not interested. They said, well, who's interested in her uh, thing? And it's been such a huge success because, of course, people are interested. Why wouldn't they be? My job is to make them interested. If I'm interested, then I have to make you, engage you, to get you interested in what I'm saying and what I, why I feel it's important for you to know this. So it, it has... Um, so the kind of work one does also is like after, and the, the transformative power of theater, you know? The play on sexual abuse was, I think, particularly moving because it was commissioned by an NGO that, uh, that uh, works with survivors of sexual abuse. And when we did it, we had people after every show coming and crying because their own stories came back to them, which were very suppressed. But more than that, men came to me and said, you know, I don't think I'll ever leave a daughter of mine alone with a male servant ever in my life, even for like half an hour, because he was so scared. And then people said, why, but why only, uh, why only uh, um, a, a young girl? Even a young boy can be molested. So I would not leave any, any of my children alone with somebody I didn't trust at all. So it can, it can, it has a very, I don't do only that kind of work, but really, if you use theater as a tool of change, it has enormous power, enormous power to transform things. To, uh, and the best theater, which I hope mine does to some extent, is that it must make you look at the world anew, to examine things anew, provoke you to think about things in a different way, to re-examine things, to, to understand the world anew. And the best theater does do that. The best, the best writing does do that. Uh, art can do that. So, so you know, it, I, then I started realizing the power of the performing arts. I mean, they're limitless, as your field is limitless in, in, in where it can go. You know, maybe none of us will exist. There'll just be, you know, two AI sort of types sitting over here and talking. But, <laughs> but whatever, whatever, uh, you know. So, so to me, it's that infinite possibilities of what theater can do, what the stage can, you know, can be a crucible for. That is very, very exciting. So um, you made a really good point about theater being a tool to tell stories, right? And, and you've certainly taken that um, across the world. And here in the Western world, we have a very strong theater um, very. culture, very strong theater scene. Uh, you know, likes of uh, the Book of Mormon, uh, you know, very well, common name, right? I wouldn't use that as my, well, my, my top my, of the list my, example. My, 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 point, <laughs> my point is these are very common names that a lot of people know. Now, yes, uh, theater yes. in India um, has a very, almost a cult following. People follow it, and then most of the country doesn't uh, actually follow it. Are you seeing this change? Are you... What do you mean? Uh, it's, it, you know, most people, when you grow up and go, going through India, you don't really go to theater and watch plays. That's not a thing most people do. Because uh, theater's never been right, and, and this a is my question to you. Going habit. Right, this is my question to you: Is yes. are you seeing this change in India? Is this culture growing, or is it diminishing? Yes, What's yes, yes. Uh, the thing is, see, firstly, uh, we have a very strong tradition of um, what may I call the folk theater. It's very alive and very kicking, and it's very much there. But we're talking about a more urban kind of theater. So that kind of theater is definitely growing, and in some. Some languages, you know, India is so diverse. I don't know any other country as diverse as that. I mean, 37 languages, dialects, God knows how many, whatever, whatever. So, <laughs> I mean, I do, can't even count the number of... Uh, I go down south in India, and I sometimes feel I'm an alien country, really, sometimes, because it's so diametrically different, the culture. 
And uh, so what I was saying was that in some, in some uh, states like Gujarat, like Maharashtra, like, uh, let's say, Canada, uh, Bangalore, in, in some languages, it's a thriving uh, culture scene, uh, theater scene, where theater is done, like Marathi theater, 30 plays a month, sometimes 35, double ones on, on weekends and all that. And it's commercially viable, and people live by theater. Gujarati is a very commercial theater. So it's the Hindi and English theater which is, uh, which is not so, uh, you know, but in a place like Bombay, because they have access, like in New York, they can do so many other things. They don't only have to do theater. They can be on television. They can do commercials. They can host events. They can do voicing. They can do films. They can do web series. So they're working actors. They can do lots of other things. But yes, it is not like in, but let me tell you, in America also, it's only the big Broadway shows that an actor can actually live on. If he's doing smaller theaters, no way. He has to do other stuff. He has to. It's just that in a Broadway gig, he's, uh, he's short of income for a year or you know so many months or whatever, whatever. But then again, he's out there auditioning, 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 hoping to get that next good gig. So it's one of the most uncertain businesses in the world, being an actor, let me tell you. <laughs> so you, you were um, here... But things are changing, which is what I was coming to. A lot of young people are very interested in doing theatre. And one of the things we did do, and I will say it again a little immodestly, is we, we were the first to start working with Indian writing. So once that door opened, you see, we always did, in, especially theatre in English, which is derivative. We did a Tennessee Williams, an Arthur Miller, uh, you know, a Neil Simon, or, a, or a, you know, of course, Shakespeare and Brecht and, you know, whatever, whatever. So many wonderful playwrights in the West. And people keep saying, why don't you do them? I said, because the whole world is there to do them. I have to do my, my stuff. Once in a blue moon, I get seduced by a fabulous script. And I do it. But that's like one-off, you know. Or I feel it's so universal, like I'm doing a play... Uh, which is about the Iraq war, about it, survivors of the Iraq war between the two Gulf wars. And it's just such a potent piece of theater. Uh, and it's a one-woman show, which my daughter does, and she's incredible in it, that it's about survival. It's about violence. It's about the times we live in. You know, So it doesn't matter. It could be Iraq. It could be Timbuktu. It could be uh, Bombay. We've had terrorist attacks there. We're having them all over the world. So how to survive in an age of violence. And women, because you see, women aren't the, perpetu uh, the, uh, the ones who perpetrate it, but they are the ones who live with it. Right. Men go out there, you know, to do their stuff, to prove themselves in whatever ways they think they have to. <laughs> but, but the women pay the price. So these are the stories of women survivors and how they deal with it. An eight-year-old child who plays with bullets, makes chains out of them, and is very proud of her little... Uh, M16 bullets, uh, two women, somebody in exile who's staying in London, who's very upset about what's going on but can't go there and handle it, to a painter who compromises, who does what she has to do, but she has to paint, so she doesn't care. So, you know, those stories are so universal that all geographical, sociocultural references become absolutely irrelevant. Then sometimes I do them. But yeah, theater is, is, is in Bombay at least, it's, it's growing exponentially. But we can never compare it to film, television, and all that, you know? That's our mistake. We keep comparing it. It's a niche medium. A play of mine, like Dance Like a Man, that I've done 600 shows off, you multiply that even by 1,000 people per show. How many is that? Yeah, it's not very many, but movies okay. reach millions In of In one people. weekend, yeah. Yeah. somebody will see a movie of mine, which is at least 100 times that. So how can you compare the two? But look at the freedom you have artistically creatively when you do work uh, in the theater. You can't do that sort of work in film as an actor or as, uh, as, as a director, producer. Uh, so two of your cast members, uh, Rajesh Vaisa, are very Seva much here. Seva. Three of them are here um, from the play Gohar. Wonderful. They're in the crowd. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you decided to cast them? And then I'd like to bring them up on stage yes, and uh, chat with them a little very bit. very much. So I was looking, uh, you know, in India we don't have a concept of um, training in musical theater because that needs special skills. You need to be an actor, you need to be a good singer, you need to be preferably a good dancer and have enormous stage presence. I mean, that's all, all rolled into one, uh, nothing much. So we, since we don't have trained actors like that, it was, it's 
particularly difficult in India, you know, abroad. They go to drama school, they specialize in musical theater. So it's much easier. But that didn't daunt me, of course. Uh, and the play was written actually not as a musical. I have done musicals. This was written as a play, which is a drama about her life. And we have two Gohars, the younger up to a certain age, and then the older Gohar. Um, and so they, 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 Mahesh, who adapted it, it's from a wonderful book, which is researched for five years by Vikram Sampath on his own steam, at his own expense, because he was fascinated by her. I think he was half in love with this Gohar John. And he wrote the book. Then I liked the book very much. So I asked a very, very eminent playwright of ours, who's a Sahitya Academy winner, Mahesh Datani, to write it as a play. And uh, then there was this triumvirate talks going on, you know, about I want this, no, I want that, no, I don't want that, and all that sort of thing. So finally we got the script together. And he said, we'll just play her music. Now, this is again, thanks to Google. So how do we find her music? Because she sang in 1902. And so we Googled her, we went to YouTube and found her. And uh, I said, oh my God, because it was a really primitive recording. You know, these were, these were those wax records, the very first records ever made. And she did something, and she was a, a, a fabulously fascinating woman of, on many counts. I won't go into that. But she took up the gaunt, she picked up the gauntlet because an Indian rag can go on for three hours. It's just this one phase, which you just keep singing, and it's like jazz. You keep improving, improving, improving. And the more of a virtuoso you are, the more you will improve to show your skills because they're just the seven notes and you're doing all kinds of things with them. So <clears throat> he, he uh, said, so, so, so she had to do that in two and a half minutes. She had to do the prelude, the central section, and the climax. And all the purists turned up their noses and said, this is blasphemy. You can't do this sort of thing. And she said, show me the money. <laughs> so uh, they paid us in those days, I don't know what it would be, 3,000 rupees a recording in 1902. Wow. What would that be today? I don't know. How many thousands of dollars? Huh? Google it. <laughs> huh? Google it. <laughs> so um, anyway, some obscene amount of money. And she said, it can be done. And even her mother said, what are you doing? Our, our gurus will be very shocked. You can't do this sort of thing. So she said, but I have to try it. I'm going to try it. And so that's why she was the first. Everybody followed suit later, but she said, I will do it. So she, she was a, you know, a path breaker. I think it's such an appropriate thing that I found her on the net through Google, and I'm sitting here talking about her. And she, like Google, was, a, was someone who loved new ideas. You know? She kept telling her mother, you know, they, they had all these patrons, these Maharajas and all, you know, who used to call them for concerts and things. And she said, we, the patrons of the new world uh, the marvels of the new world will find us our patrons. So we don't have to worry about these Maharajas anymore. You know, this, is, this is technology. This is what's going to live, you know? So, uh, and she says that. There's a moving moment at the end of the play when she says, you know, I went to hear a concert, and I said, this is my music. This guy is singing my song. And everybody, I told everybody, and they said, oh, this crazy old lady, this biddy, how can this be her music? And she said, doesn't matter. Uh, my name also will be forgotten, but my music will live on that record, and it'll always be there. And that is why we're here today, because her music lives, and we can, we can access it through technology. So much as I am a great believer in the human touch, I'm, I'm really old-fashioned. I still prefer smelling a book, feeling the page, you know, all that with my coffee. I'm not a Kindle person. Uh, but, but having said that, technology can be used very creatively in, in the arts as well. You know, it, sh can't, it should not become a substitute and it shouldn't become packaging or gimmicky, but it can add a lot. You know, we've seen it in so many industries. I mean, music industry and this and that. It brings a lot, it brings a lot. Um, and it also reflects our times. These are our times, these are technological times. So even our art should, should, should you know, I have a friend called Shobhade, her husband is doing uh, paintings on a smartphone with a stylus. And he's, he's doing these exhibitions and they, they're selling out. They're selling out his paintings. They're, they're not very expensive. But it's a new, new way to paint. And it's still art. So it's wonderful. I mean, there's you know, the installations, there's visual art. There's so much use of technology now in the, in, in the arts. 
But as long as we don't lose the human connect, that's, that's all that's important. So I had a bit of a problem because I said, now what am I going to do? I need two wonderful, uh, I mean, I need a wonderful cast because we have many other wonderful actors in the play. But we need two wonderful gohars who can sing, who can act. So the younger one was Rajeshwari Sachdev, who's a very talented actress who also has cut albums and sung. And she's a very nice Bharatnatyam dancer, though she was doing Kathak in the play. Uh, and she's a very fine actress, a national award winning actress. So I sort of zoned into her and you know, I said, she's the one I want and she was also very thrilled with the part. Now there was the older Gohar. Uh, and the, the, the play wasn't conceived with music, but I decided no. When I heard those YouTube and scratchy recordings and this nasal voice, I said, my God, we're doing her a disservice if we play this. People will say, but why are they doing a play about a woman who's sounding God awful? <laughs> so we're not gonna do that. If you're gonna present her, we're gonna present her the best that she could be, as she must have sounded when she sang like this uh, at, at a mehful or a concert or something. So, so that made my job even more difficult and then I decided I want live musicians. And one of the instruments of that period was the sarangi, which is a kind of, what would you say, kind of violin of that time. So there are very few people who are playing that instrument anymore. So, and a tabla player and a harmonium player and all that. So, uh, and musicians are their own sort of divas, you know. So they said, yeah, today we can come. Okay, tomorrow maybe we can't come and all that sort of thing. Uh, so we got, so I did, I pulled out a wild card for the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, I had heard her sing and she has a magnificent voice, really magnificent. Uh, she's the great Ustad Vilayat Khan Saab's daughter who learned music at her father's knee where she went at eight and said she was very depressed and extremely sad and he said, why is that my... Uh, darling, and he, she said, because nobody's teaching me music, because she was a girl, and all the boys were being taught music. So he said, all right, we can fix that. So she started learning from him. And she's a Sufi singer, and she uh, sings in many, many sort of styles. So I'd heard her sing, and I thought, what a fabulous voice she has. And I know she hadn't acted. I mean, she did something, something very small, long, long back uh, on stage, but, but she has enormous stage presence, lovely voice and lovely speaking voice as well. And I said, you know what, you know what, I'm gonna take her. And everyone said, oh, she has a fabulous voice, but are you sure you wanna take her as an actor? I said, yeah, I'm gonna take her as an actor. And she's done a marvelous job. I mean, she sings and blows your socks off, but that aside, she's done a lovely job of the, of the play as well. So we have these two gohars, and then we have Danny Sura here, who plays multiple parts. Uh, he's an actor who moved uh, from London. He's a trained actor from London who moved to India. And he plays many, many roles in the play. And we have uh, four other actors. We have two young actresses who are from here, from the Bay Area, who have small roles, uh, which we, we cast here. So Kanya and, uh, and Sanjana, the two beauties sitting next to Danny. Uh, so, and then we have another person called Rajiv, who's, who's coming in late tomorrow. So he's there, and Denzel Smith, who plays uh, who plays the father of Gohar when she was young, and also Gaysberg, the American Anglophile sort of engineer who went, he was American, but he stayed in England, so he was more Brit than an American. And he, he, took, um, he went to look for the big star for the gramophone company, who would sing for the first time on the vinyl record. So there was a great opera singer who sang at the same time that Gohar sang. So they both sang in different parts of the world, and cut a record at the same time. And uh, he comes down. So I was hoping he'd be here because he, was, he has a little lovely speech when he tells us about how he landed here and how his, that one record changed the, the history of Indian music forever. That record that she sang, the first record that she sang. So it's sort of connected to technology. I was very finding it, I was thinking about it last night and I said, how appropriate that I'm coming to Google with Gohar and talking about Gohar which actually at its base, the play, has the historical importance of technology, really. So that was quite uh, serendipitous, I think. <laughs> um, let's invite them on stage. Yes, yeah, Rajesh Shuri Sachdev and Zilla Khan. <laughs> Come on then. Hi. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Please. Please. Hi. Hello. So 
So Registry, you um, played uh, the younger uh, guards on, in, in the play. Uh, how, how do you balance sort of adding your own creative touch to this character uh, while still being true to the real person? Oh, what a difficult question. <laughs> um, well, what as an actor, it is our job to understand the part. And, it be, and that only comes with a lot of study about the character that you're doing. And she, unfortunately, is not in front of us. I'm sorry about my voice, a bad case of laryngitis. Um, <clears throat> but it'll be so, fine by Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> we'll be fine by Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, yes. Um, uh, you have to study a part. It's very good if you have a living character to play so you can see the person. But we were very fortunate that uh, Vikram Sampat wrote a book, My Name is Gohar Jan. Meticulously researched. Meticulously researched. Every little part. He tried to piece together uh, all her letters and what her life could have been and the society of those times. It's so well explained, so detailed, that it was a cakewalk after that, honestly, because it was all on a platter for us. But also I think it's interesting when it's <coughs> not there, it also gives you that space to fill those blanks. That also that works in the script because obviously you can't put the whole book in a two-hour play. Now, to get that message across to the audience, now I have read the book, so I know where it comes from, what we have derived from where. But when as an actor I'm piecing together bits of a life, there's a lot that I'm bringing to that one scene, which the audience is not really aware of because there's a study that's gone. So that's interesting, trying to put things in between lines, in those moments, in those pauses, trying to add that little extra. That's always an exciting journey for an actor. And I think that's a process we have in every part that we do. A lot <coughs> of us here in the crowd grew up in the, in the indie pop era and uh, listening to your work was, uh, you know, just natural for us. <laughs> so uh, I, I know you're um, uh, you're recovering from a uh, from a throat issue. So but so if you're comfortable with this and if you don't mind singing us one line of Hule Hulare, we'd we'll love oh. it. Just one line. <laughs> my God, should I try that? Okay, I have to take my director's permission because she's asked me to keep my mouth shut till my show. Say your voice. Not that she's doing anything of the kind. No, I am. I am. I am. Promise. <laughs> I would have sung. I would have belted it out. But I can try. Maybe I cannot really belt just, it. Just sing a couple lines. Yeah. Hule hulare hule 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 hulare hule 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 sona roop se ja ke hule peri chanjar pa ke hule hatte mehndi la ke giddha pa mutte aare shara ra 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 giddha pa mutte aare shara ra 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 chan chade ach bahare shara ra 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 lovely thank you thank you <laughs> I'm going to make the, them sing anyway. I mean, she's going to sing less because yeah. she's done a bit. So yes, Yoji, um, you um, you've obviously been uh, singing for a long time in your in your life. Uh, how did you prepare for this role, portraying a, a character who was? Uh, Will it help me? <laughs> Every step of the way, she helped me, and she helped me open uh, those uh, sometimes painful, sometimes lovely uh, visuals in your life that women and men go through. And then she opened, and it, she made it so easy. She is a fantastic director because, and I'm not just saying it here, because um, it was very difficult for me. Singing my concerts, which I always do, is a different skill, skill set, as Lilith had already mentioned. And uh, uh, the play has its own pace. When we are doing concerts, we are doing it at our own pace. Uh, it is my pace. But a play has its pace of its own, and you have to, you have to play along with the p pace of the play. <coughs> and, and you're part of a team. And, you, and the part of the team, uh, the pace of the play, the back and forth of dialogues. And not everybody helped me, including uh, the boys. And let, let its way of explaining direction uh, really helped me a lot because um, but I've been fortunate to have lovely gurus. My father was an amazing guru in music. He taught me. He used to explain each and every little thing and open it out. And in my acting, this one, and uh, this one, this gorgeous one, who I've enjoyed her talk. And, yes. and, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you. As an Indian, as a woman, um, it's so important to be associated with 
a production as fabulous as this, and then uh, coming here, uh, and a production as fabulous as the you music know, enact was it was oh, yeah, like just buying hot ka khel. She, I mean, it was like a <laughs> Like, okay, I need music to do comes. that. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so music music was naturally. not, but I must tell you that she worked very hard. very hard. You know what I loved about her was that at this age, where you are so, so respected and admired in your field, and you've reached such a height, to challenge yourself and risk all that in a new area, you know, it needs a lot of courage, and I love that. I mean, I love doing new things. Yeah. I love doing new things to keep myself fresh. People yeah. say, what's the best thing you've done? What's the best play you've done? Yeah. The best film you've done? Firstly, the best thing I've ever done is produce two children called Neha and Ira. Those are my best productions. <laughs> I agree. <You> also, <laughs> two best productions <laughs> of my life. Nothing can, nothing can <laughs> compare with that. But after them, there is nothing the best. The minute as a creative person you say, I have done that and that was my best, go hang up your sandals and go home. It's all over. You are constantly, the journey is excitement. You know, once I've done a play, I'm thinking of the next play. I'm thinking of the next thing I'm going to do. I mean, I love what I've done. It's not like I disassociate myself with it. But my mind's sticking on what I'm going to do next. That next high that I'm looking for is when I create the next piece. Till I struggle and find it and get it right and then it's never right. Let me tell you, nothing I've ever done is I feel right. I feel it, there's so much that could be improved in it. No role. People say, what's your best role? I said, maybe if I had done work like Sarah Bernhardt, maybe I wouldn't be bad. I would have done something. I want to do all the male Shakespeare parts myself one day, <laughs> um, just to reverse the whole thing, you know? <laughs> but, but, but... Like uh, James Bond, when Angelina Jolie said, <laughs> Yes, I'd love to play James Bond myself. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I, Sarah course, Bernhardt yes. did that. She was this wonderful new act. I mean, wonderful female actress who played only the male parts, Hamlet and Macbeth, and you know, she just move yeah. over. I'll show you how to do that. So, uh, so um, you know, she to 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 challenge yourself anew like that, you know, and then you are like a, a child because you're coming into an area. It's like me trying to become a you know a computer scientist. I mean, I know nothing. I become Robert De Niro as the intern. But, <laughs> but <laughs> all those guys in the Google movie, you know, my friend asked, what's his name, Asim Manvi? Was <laughs> I loved it, those two guys, you know, and this ripe old age coming to like hang out with the Googlers and do their thing and all that, and not scared, not scared. <laughs> so that's what she was. She was a little Googler who came to a new space completely. And everybody obviously was more trained in a sense than her. But she was not afraid. She was not afraid. To, to sound like she didn't know uh, or anything. You know, that's a wonderful quality. I think that's how you grow. Yeah. You grow when you keep on exploring uh, latent things in you. You know, Vinita suddenly leaves the tech world, says, okay, enough of that. Let's get on. Let's get into something called theater, <laughs> which she might have done in college, but this is another animal, if you know what I mean. So, you know, to keep trying new stuff. People say, Ab aapke zinde mein kya bacha hai, kya aapke regrets, nee, not regrets, but kya karna chahengi, aapne ye bhi kiya, wo bhi kiya. I said, my God, every year that I get older, the clock is ticking louder and louder and louder. And I'm saying, heck, I've got such little time, I want to write a book, maybe cut an album one day, you know, um, make some movies, do this, do that. I mean, maybe I'll do none of it. But at least the bucket list is growing that long. <laughs> so, so I think that's what keeps you creatively, your juices flowing, uh, is when you are not scared to keep trying things, new things. Uh, and that's one thing about Zilla Masi. She worked very, very hard, and she was um, fearless. But I think as a producer, director, she was the most fearless of the lot. Yes. Because when she called me and she said, uh, you know, doing Gohar, I said, wow. As an actor, I was very thrilled. She said, do yeah. you sing? I said, yeah, but I'm not a classical singer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was so scared. I was, and those days I was filming for something else. So every day I used to go to the shoot yeah. and I would be singing on the way, Riyaz Kuro, but I don't even know how to do proper Riyaz. And in the moving cars, I would go, okay, so, uh, something. So I told her, I said, I don't know, yeah. So I, don't, I said, I don't know how good I will be in the first show. Oh, you're very good. I don't know how well I'm gonna pull this off, but I promise you, by the 30th show, I'll be standing there and saying, yes, yes, I can do this well. <laughs> and much before the 30th show. <laughs> so, so I wanted them <coughs> to, to do a small song in which actually they're in costume and it's very different and looks stunning. 
the whole, uh, you know, Maison Saint scene. But uh, to do just the last, one last song, when it's a beautiful scene, when the two Gohars, the older Gohar dies, and the play keeps going back and forth in time. You know, I mean, not even chronologically, 1895 to suddenly 1902, to back to 1929, uh, 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 back to this, back to that. Keeps the audiences nice and properly on their toes to figure out what's going on. So all of you are coming <laughs> on Sunday. <laughs> I'm warning you. So, um, so uh, at the end, when she dies, it's in a surreal space, and the two gohars meet, the young <laughs> and the old. So your 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 own. 22-year-old meets, or whatever, 30-year-old meets your 59-year-old self, and we talk a little bit. So it's that scene at the end, which is the penultimate, the ultimate scene. And then there's a little song, which is one of her most, uh, when I fell in love with Gohar, after I had decided to do her, was I heard Shubha Mutgal singing this song, which she's gonna sing just now. And it made my hair rise. And I said, my God, her yeah. song is still being sung. Yeah. And Shubha, of course, rocked it. But I said, and she was very impressed because I went to her and I said, isn't this Gohar Jam's song? And she looked at me and she said, my oh, God, I didn't know you know so much about classical music. And I said, well, you know, one knows a little bit. And then I said, I better not bullshit her. I said, no, no, actually, I'm just doing this play. <laughs> she said, I thought there was something here. You seem too well acquainted with all her music. <laughs> so I said, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm doing her music. That's how I know it. So it's a stunning song, and I would love sh um, her to sing it. I'm not going to, they both sing it together, but because her voice is not okay, but she dances the kathak with it. So you get a feel of the play, and we are going to get off the stage yeah. now. So I'd, heard, I'd learned Gohar Jan's bandishes and many thousands of different kinds of bandishes from different gharanas from my father since I was a child. So when this anban came to me, so it was quite uh, something that I've already learned from. Uh, and it's one of the most beautiful pieces of Kohar's, and I'm so, all your pieces that you have selected in the song, in the whole uh, of uh, Gohar is exceptionally beautiful. Uh, we, shall we start? Yeah. Shravan, we're ready. So now, there's just the two of us. Who was the person you were hoping to meet here? Ami? Where is she? Have you seen her? She's right here with us. <sighs> Ami. She always quoted Rumi. Here it is. You have to keep breaking your heart until it opens. You have to keep breaking your heart until it opens. It's opened. It's opened. Let's celebrate the way we know best, with a song. Not any song, but the one we love best. That one? Mm -hmm. Don't you feel sad singing it? Not anymore. <laughs> Our sad song. Let's make it a happy one.
Thanks. I, I want to bring up one more person. Uh, we have uh, Vinita Bellani. She is a part of uh, Enact Arts. Uh, she she brought this uh, play and uh, many other. Uh, she brings many other productions uh, here to the U.S. Uh, so let's bring uh, Vinita up on stage and uh, hear more about. Hi, hey. Vinita. Hey, Please join us. Uh, could you, you. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about your company and uh, what else is coming uh, in the pipeline for, for you here? Well, everybody heard Lillette talk. Um, everybody understands the compulsion for theater. Everybody understands the importance by now. And if you haven't understood it, uh, I don't know anybody could be more articulate than, <laughs> than Lillette on, on the idea. And just like Lillette started her theater company years and years ago because there was um, a vacuum. There were Indian stories were not being told in English. Um, I start. I have to confess. I'm almost embarrassed to confess this after the let's talk that I am a computer scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, I lived in the tech world for a long time. I did three startups. Uh, Inact is my fourth startup. Uh, it's very much a Silicon Valley startup. We are a talent incubator. We are bootstrapped in the garage. We've been through our friends and family round of funding and now going to a Series A funding, which is why um, Lilette is here. She's our centerpiece for our gala on Saturday. <laughs> so, so we are using tech, as Gohar used tech, to, to change the history of music. Um, in many ways in um, Atenac. But we are now um, in the diaspora of South Asians, people originally from South Asians, um, a significant community. And we are sitting on the edge of two cultures, the culture that at least our children are sitting on the edge of two cultures. And we are sort of on the edge of two cultures, which is you know, the culture that we came from, the culture that we live in. So Enact does a lot of work which is layered in um, diaspora playwrights. We are a talent incubator in all aspects in theater, playwriting, stage management, acting, music, dance, performance. Um, as, as a female artistic director of a theater company, I feel very compelled to tell the stories of women who can be strong role models for our daughters and for our sons. We did a play last year called Sound Waves, which is the story of Noor and Ayat Khan. She was this young Muslim girl living in Paris, daughter of a Sufi preacher who joined the World War II um, spy um, movement because um, she, she was compelled, even as a pacifist, to do something to stop the war. And she got a George Cross. She was given the, uh, the Croix de Guerre by France. Um, Churchill admitted that she had, she had reduced the course of World War II by at least four to six months just with her work in the French resistance alone. And you know, even I hadn't heard about Noor and Ayat Khan. So these are stories that need to be told. Um, Vikram Sampath, who wrote the book My Name is Gohar Jan, um, is a classmate of mine from Bitspilani, also an engineer. <laughs> Sometimes we do some things right, right? <laughs> and I, somebody had given me his book, and I said, oh my gosh, I wish somebody write a play about this so we could do it. And then we found out that the play had been written and lit, had done it. And then, um, so there you go, between this and there. And uh, Gohar is a story that needs to be told. There are many stories that need to be told. But Enact exists because um, our stories are not being told in the, the demographic in which we live. We are telling them to our own people. Everybody here in the, in the Bay Area, for example, there is, no, um, there is no demographic majority anymore. There's a whole bunch of minorities. And all these minorities are practicing their art in silos. And we are trying to break these cultural silos and give our mm, children an opportunity to grow and develop their talent. You know, for, for every 10 people who become engineers, there is that one 11th person that does want to become a Lilet Dube or a Zubin Mehta. So um, where is the training ground for these people? The training ground is an act. And uh, here's my two <laughs> wonderful um, trainees. In, we, yeah, we're a talent incubator. We tell stories from South Asia. Uh, we have a lot of fun doing it, and we do it in all humility. Wonderful. What's coming next the, to the Bay Area that, uh, that you're bringing? Oh, thank you for asking that question, because <laughs> uh, I am directing a play that we had commissioned by a Hollywood scriptwriter called My Fair Dude. Um, it's a sort of tongue-in-cheek 
tongue-in-cheek take on um, the original My Fair Lady story, the Pygmalion story, but it is set right here in Silicon Valley. Uh, the protagonist is a young, um, nerdy engineer um, living and working in a tech company, and uh, he's having trouble dating. And <laughs> see, everybody identifies with this. <laughs> And he's having trouble dating because he hasn't quite got the social dynamic straight. Uh, and he gets helped by, by a girl called Abby, who is the VP of technology at his company. She just happens to be very lesbian, very badass. Um, and, and she takes him in hand, and she finds him uh, a tutor uh, who is, um, and I won't reveal the rest of it because you just have to come and see it. But that is a story about people like you and my kids and everybody who's living here in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Um, it's an out and out slapstick, uh, Broadway-esque musical song and dance uh, hoo-ha kind of play. We do some of those too. When do we, <laughs> when is this uh, scheduled to? That's coming uh, up in May. Um, we are doing, uh, before that, we are doing a play that we opened in January um, in San Francisco called The Parting, which is a very intense and a very gut-wrenching kind of play because it's the story of partition told by the survivors of partition who crossed the line on both sides. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck with, uh, with Gohar and all your other yes, productions. Yes, and thank you for and having Lillette and all of these wonderful people here. And thank you for inviting me as well. Of course. Thank you.